Good morning, everyone. I'm Kim Horton. I'm the Chief Economist at the Regional Australia Institute. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I'm meeting on, the Noongar people, and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I also welcome any other First Australians who are part of our webinar cast this morning. Today is our sixth Regions Rising webinar series for this year, and our focus today is on regional creative industries, community and economic development during COVID-19, and we'll look at how some parts of the industry have adapted during these extremely challenging times. I'd like to welcome our three guests today, Ros Abercrombie, Executive Director of Regional Arts Australia, Sarah Stanley, Chair of Collie Community Bank, President of the Shire of Collie and Director at Gumfire Marketing, and lurking in the background is Andrew Gray, Executive Director of South East Arts. You should have received a link to view their bios in the reminder emails from Zoom. Uh, the session is being recorded uh, and we'll make it available online later this afternoon, along with the slides from the presenters. We're also streaming to YouTube live today for those that can't access Zoom. I would like to let everybody know that there is media on the line as well today. And also please remember to get vocal on social media using the hashtag Regions Rising and you can tag us on Twitter at Regional OS, that's AUS. Before we get further into it, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank our Regions Rising National Series sponsor, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, and their charitable arm, the Community Enterprise Foundation. Without them, we wouldn't be able to continue delivering these free webinars, and which I think have been really valuable in keeping us connected. Today, we have Sarah representing one part of the diverse Bendigo Bank family, the community banking sector, and she'll talk about their role and influence on a place in gathering resources when it's been really needed. So thank you to Bendigo and Adelaide Bank for their continued support and their commitment to regional communities. We've only got an hour today, so I'd like to make the most of it and then we'll have some time for Q&A after our presenters speak. You can submit your questions at any time through the uh, Q&A function in Zoom. Make sure to write your organisation where you're from and who you're directing your question to if there's someone you're singling out. If your question is chosen, my team here will enable your microphone so you can ask it directly. We've received some questions in advance too, and hopefully you'll hear answers to those in the discussion today. A little bit of background for me before we get started with the, 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 first, the first presentation. The cultural and creative economy in Australia is in normal years, a huge part of Australia's economic activity. In 2016-17, it was valued at over $111 billion which is almost double the value of agricultural production in Australia. It comprises, the industry comprises over 650,000 designers, makers, producers and performers, as well as almost 200,000 creative people embedded in other parts of the economy as well. These figures come from a new report released recently by Art Advocacy Organisation, A New Approach. In regional Australia, the culture and creative economy plays many vital roles. It creates a lively and thriving environment that is distinctive, which encourages people to move to an area, to remain living in an area, or to visit an area as a tourist and perhaps spend some money. RAI research has found that in a regional labour market, where in fact many regions are struggling to attract and retain skilled trade and technical workers and professional workers, it's often the particular attraction of cultural vitality and vibrancy that takes a worker to one place rather than another. There's a lot of competition in regional Australia for these high, high, high skilled uh, trades jobs and professions and places that stand out are the ones that seem to be doing better in getting the workers they need. Smaller regional places have their own particular character and our research has, has identified many creative hotspots, including Byron Bay, Hobart, the Anangu Pitjantjara lands, Surf Coast in Victoria, Noosa and the Adelaide Hills. For our regional cities, our bigger centres, our research has shown that a bigger cultural and creative sector is linked to faster population growth and greater economic diversity. Cultural and creative businesses have been hit hard by COVID restrictions, particularly those relying on people coming together as buyers or as audiences. But our regional communities have rallied and we'll hear this morning about some inspirational responses and some innovative ways that communities and individuals have come together and reimagined themselves to make sure that in fact, the show does go on. So let's start with the national picture from Ros Abercrombie, Executive Director of Regional Arts Australia. Thanks, Ros. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much, Kim, for the, um, and Nina for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am just gonna share my screen and talk through a few 
um, slides. So just bear with me for one second as I share this. Oh, one sec, sorry, just having a few. There we go, I think I'm there. Thank you, apologies for that. So um, yeah, firstly, just um, as Kim also did, just acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which we're zooming in from. Um, I'm zooming in from Wurundjeri country, um, land of the Kulin nations. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, just a slide up here, which I think just sets the scene a little bit for some of the conversation that we'll be talking about. And this was a quote that came in um, last year when we were in our last federal election campaign. And this is from a young student who was um, a supporter of the Regional Arts Fund, which is a program where we support, and talking about how significantly important the arts and creative industries are to young people um, in regional communities and how important that is and something very close to their heart. So I think that just sort of sets the scene of a voice from community, from a young person in that community. Just very briefly in the context here, just in case people won't know Regional Arts Australia, we're a national peak body, um, we're not-for-profit, um, and the national voice for arts in Regional Australia. And our main focus and our main role is to seek to ensure that the arts are seen as essential in all of Regional and Remote Australia. And I'll talk about that a little bit further. Um, and I think importantly in the conversation we're having now is that time is right for the arts and creative industries to take a lead role in regional development. Um, and we're a crucial part of that. As Kim said, the livability of regions. We're crucial in the um, thriving, healthy communities, but also in the sustainable economic growth. <clears throat> and this is what I'd like to sort of talk about in this context is that it's, it's important for us to, as an industry, to connect with all of regional policy. It's important for us to look at cross industry and cross portfolios so that we can see where we're having connection across digital connectivity, across education, across health and services, um, and how that then informs both cultural tourism, cultural infrastructure, connectivity, livability, placemaking, and particularly of our First Nations colleagues um, around First Nations welcome, um, acknowledgement of country, practice on country, and such. Oh, something's going wrong, sorry here. Um, as Kim said, there's a huge amount of um, material coming through around the economic impact of the cultural and creative economy and mentioned the new approach report, which um, used the, the figures, the ABS figures from 2016 to 17, when we look at the creative and cultural industry of contributing um, $11.7 billion, which <clears throat> essentially an important figure there is making up 8.1% of the workforce. This figure is made up of 12 domains um, and they're quite broad, as Kim mentioned. One of the other figures that I think is really important to talk to is the Australian Institute's um, background brief paper, which was released um, in late June. And this took a new subcategory and looked at a subcategory for the arts and the entertainment sector. And within that arts and entertainment sector, there's um, creative and performing arts activities, there's motion pictures, publishing, internet publishing, heritage, and library and other services that make up that sector. And that arts and entertainment sector contributes to $14.7 billion um, a year um, and importantly um, makes up sort of just under 200,000 employees into the Australian economy and that's 1.8 percent of the total workforce so when you look at this in dollar figures I think there's one really interesting fact is that you know for every million dollars turnover the arts and entertainment industry produces nine jobs um, which equates to you know over the one job that is in the construction industry. So I think economically we can see just phenomenal impact and phenomenal value. Um, when we know we know this that before COVID hit, and obviously from a regional perspective, we were already in trouble. We were already recovering from bushfires, from floods, and from drought. But before COVID, um, the creative industries were thriving, at, and they were um, growing at twice the rate of the rest of the Australian economy. Um, and the live arts particularly, which we know has been badly hit, was thriving. And in the most recent report that the Australia Council produced, the Creating Our Future, um, they had the results from the National Arts Participation Survey. And in that, you know, it's no news to us, but it's great to have the data that 98% of Australians engage in the arts in some way. And so that comes back to the arts being essential and connected to everything that we do in our communities and in our societies. Um, and importantly, when we look at this, it's, it's not just a one-way relationship of that engagement. It's not just an employee to an employer. Um, there's much more diversity in how the arts and creative industries connect. And it's between individuals, audiences, institutions. There's a really broad ecology that we need to look at. 
And when we consider that in a regional context, um, the arts and the creative ecologies are, are, are even more embedded. They're embedded into community, into businesses and education and health. When we look at the national picture then, and we look at what happened and what is continuing to happen with COVID, is that there was a very much a, a everyone with, there was an experience that everyone felt. Um, now, as we're coming through various different stages of recovery, we've got different restrictions in different states and territories. Some of the key things that we were dealing with and continue to deal with are capacities of our venues, particularly our live music performance, um, small balls and outdoor festival sites. The movement of people, the movement of artists, the movement of productions, the movement of touring, the movement of audiences, and really importantly, communication and access. And by this, we're talking about digital connectivity and digital scaffolding. Um, and the, I think there's one thing I would like to say here, there's some real positives here that, that the COVID um, uh, experiences provided us. And that's that the digital platform allowed for regional artists and regional organizations to have um, an access that was more equivalent and more balanced. We had regional presenters, regional artists on panels like never before. Um, and we had um, ability to have online auditions and online sort of studios. However, the challenges are still there. We know that regional connectivity is not as great as Metro and we know we have significant issues with particularly upload um, speeds. And for us ourselves, we had to pivot. Um, we were planning to do our Outlands con um, conference in just September, just gone in Palawa in Launceston and we postponed that to next year. But we took that online um, and have started a conversation series. And the idea with that is that we, we are increasing our conversation over a year. We're increasing access, we're increasing connectivity in ways that we weren't able to do before. And that's really exciting. One of the um, key roles of Regional Arts Australia plays is that we deliver the Regional Arts Fund on behalf of the federal government. And I want to talk through this a little bit um, about sort of people running away too quickly. So just bear with me. Um, we deliver the Regional Arts Fund with our regional program administrators and we have one in every state and territory. So they're Regional Arts WA, Regional Arts Victoria, um, Regional Arts New South Wales, Country Arts South Australia, Rant in Tasmania, Flying Arts Alliance in Queensland and Darwin Community Arts in NT. Um, and in March, um, when the restrictions first started to hit, we had 150 programs live across the country. And in collaboration with those regional program administrators and with the Office of the Arts, we were able to be flexible with those programs and provide variations to all the projects and programs. So everything kept going in different ways, in different forms, maybe postponed. Um, and one of the other things that we did is we were starting to advocate then about the arts and creative industries in a recovery space and about looking at regionally led program-led, artistic-led investment, um, which can, provo can pro provide timely support to the affected regions. So basically a place-based program. Um, these are just the objectives of the Regional Arts Fund. I'll swim through this quickly, looking at supporting economic and social and cultural development of regional communities, building partnerships, developing audiences, and increasing employment and professional development. Importantly, the figures here, I think, are the, the important thing with the Regional Arts Fund. For, we can see here that in 2018, 2019, employed just under 2,000 um, artists and arts workers were employed through the program. A huge audience number and a huge participation number. The leverage income of this is really important. For the government spend of just uh, well, $2.68 million of government spend, the fund has a leverage income of $9.34 million. That is a huge input that is coming from both cash and in kind that is filtering in across all of regional communities and across all of engagement on the back of the fund. This is something that we've been communicating, advocating and showing the value of the arts and creative industries in the regional space. This then led to in April the 9th, and I remember the date very clearly, um, the Regional Arts Australia and the Regional Arts Fund were successful in receiving a $10 million recovery boost from the federal government um, to um, assist communities and individuals and artists to recover from COVID. Um, and this is a new national program that will provide strategic support across the whole of Australia. And we've worked with our program administrators to design this program and the program is across three phases. So it's through relief, which is a short-term response, it's through recovery, which is the medium-term response, and through renewal, which is a long-term three-year program. So importantly, this relief program goes from, it started, it opened on the 1st of July with the relief and it will go for three years in different forms so that we can really look at what communities need and how we respond. Um, 
it's important for us that we build the fabric of the cultural ecology uh, through the recovery boost. And these are some of the things we're looking at doing. Through the recovery, we're looking at community confidence, creative confidence and business confidence through connectivity, practice and partnerships. And we're looking at renewal through place basing, community cohesion, lasting impact, local supplies and job incentives. And all of that allows us to build the future based creative and arts ecology. There's a, I'll just sort of flip through this, there's a series of um, opportunities for this at the moment. And what I think is important here is that we're talking about the arts and creative industries, the show must go on, the show is going on. There's funding out there to support that show go on. And we're finding really innovative ways to, for the community and for artists to continue to work and continue to support one another. Um, we have, um, as I say here, this is the timeline for the recovery timeline, the programs all for closing this year for next year. Um, and we also have our ongoing regional arts fund, which is still in existence on top of the recovery boost and we have quick response and program, time, program guidelines out at the moment as well. Um, what RAA do is that we work with our program administrators and work in the back end to map the impact of that program. And we can map by telling a national narrative, looking at measurements, identifying need. And this allows us to put that national story together. Um, and we're looking at how we can, with what's next, how we can join those dots, how we can connect and how we can provide voice and how we can look at a more long-term sustainable framework for regional practice and regional communities and how that is importantly embedded across portfolios and across industry. Um, and that brings me to where I think we have um, the most amazing opportunity for to have a regional led recovery and regional led um, arts and creative industry is just, um, busting and, and beaming with, with opportunity. And this is from that placemaking, place branding perspective where particularly cultural tourism has, you know, it's where we're going to need to roll with both our domestic markets and also our interstate markets when borders open. Festivals, visual uh, galleries, public art, trails, heritage, performance spaces are all part of that placemaking narrative and they all connect with that national land, natural landscape, the cultural landscape and hospitality and accommodation. And I know that our colleagues on this um, webinar with Sarah and Andrew will talk a lot, I think, around this sort of placemaking place, place branding narrative around regional communities. And I'll just stop there and let others speak. Fantastic. Thanks, Ros. That's a, a wonderful overview. You've given a whole lot of resources, information there. I know people are asking whether the information will be available. And yes, we'll certainly put the slides up uh, on our website later on this afternoon so you can track Ros's Regional Arts Fund and, and the boost. Uh, and I love what you're saying at the end there, Ros, about the role of arts in cultural tourism, because as for those of you that are part of our tourism webinar last month, there's major changes afoot in, in, in who's travelling and where they're travelling to and what they're expecting in Australia. And I, and I think a, a cultural tourism revival would be a very much a part of the, the, the package. So looking forward to seeing that one play out over the next next uh, next six to 12 months. Um, thank you. We'll come back. For, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on that. We'll come back to that later. Um, so next we'll hear from Sarah Stanley. Uh, Sarah may, wears many hats, as you, as you heard at the beginning. She's chair of the uh, Collie Community Bank. Uh, president of the Shire of Collie, and also the director of our own marketing agency, Gunfire Marketing. Thank you, Sarah. Just unmute myself um, and share my screen. Hello, everyone. Share. And pop this up. So, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me along today uh, to talk with the various hats on. I'm, I'm primarily talking from the Collie Community Banks which is a, um, you know, for, for those of you who don't know the model that our partners are in Bendigo Adelaide Bank, they provide the banking licence and there are a bunch of uh, community companies in regional areas and in metro areas all around Australia uh, that provide banking services to our community. In our community, like many others, um, this bank was, was started by the community when uh, we're starting to see the exodus of, of the big four from our community and not wanting to lose that face-to-face -face, um, banking facility as time has gone on and, and the communities have changed and the way we bank has changed, this bank is still very, very relevant in our community because we're very locally focused, locally owned, and we support our community really heavily. Um, across the 20 years we've been open, we've managed to put about $7 million worth of banking product, banking profit back into our communities. And I'm gonna to talk today um, a little bit about um, some of the, the more arts focused um, programs that we've run. Before I hop into that, I just wanted to give you for, I know this is going all the way across Australia and um, we're over here in this little bottom corner, 
down here in this beautiful part of uh, Western Australia. Um, for those of you who have ever heard of Collie, you probably think of things like this, where the state's only active coal mines and for a very long time have provided um, the bulk of the electricity for the Southwest inter interconnected grid, which sort of runs from Geraldton all the way down uh, to Esperance in the South and across to Kalgoorlie. So basically we've been powering the state for a really long time and that's what people know us for. Uh, we kind of get pigeonholed into that a little bit. Uh, and when we're talking about uh, recovery with things. So, you know, this is a couple of, just a couple of graphs on us. Um, so when you talk about the, the economics of our town and, and, what, and, and the major things that are here, we've got mining is a big part, manufacturing, and that's actually our alumina refinery. That's a big chunk and power generation is over here. So three quarters of our economy has been really uh, made up by those three big sectors. But when you look over here, it tells a very different story. This is jobs. And jobs are more important to regional areas than the GDP. It really doesn't matter how many dollars are traveling through an alumina refinery to a local community. That really doesn't impact us at all. Um, over here, the jobs might, you know, are very heavily outweighed by those smaller industries, the, the small businesses, the creative businesses, the tourism businesses, the retail, all of the other. And, and that's what we've been focusing on as the electricity landscape is changing all across the world and certainly um, changing in WA. We've got lots of sun out there and with the advent of, um, of rooftop solar panels, it's really changed the way electricity has been generated, which means that we've been looking at um, what we need to do as a community for a really long time. We've got about 4,700 jobs in, in the Shire of Collie um, and about a quarter of those are directly in coal mining, they're in power generation or, you know, the smaller industries that are directly reliant on those couple of industries. So that's a big chunk of us. Um, at the same time, of those 4,700 jobs, about 2,200 of them are filled by people who don't live in our town. And that's because that's for a range of reasons. We've had to do some some soul searching about that. But you know what? Some of the reasons we think are that you know a lot of those jobs are very blokey jobs. Um, they're based on site. They're uh, very trade related. And so that starts to put pictures in people's heads about what Collie is and what sorts of people are welcome in our community and what sort of person you have to be to live in our community. And that really impacts on where people choose to live. Now, I showed you the pictures before of what you might think about Collie, but this is actually Collie. This is the Collie we know, the people who love and live in this community. It's beautiful, clean air. It's, we've got 80% bush in our environment. Uh, we love camping, we love nature, and we love our trails. We've got um, a, a fair number of all sorts of trails, mountain bike trails, hiking trails, equestrian trails, and the state government's just spending, um, in the midst of spending about $10 million improving those trails. So it's set to be a, a real um, trail destination. And we've got these beautiful blue lakes. These are actually um, old mining voids. Um, so because of the chemistry of, um, of the water there, they stay this really bright blue color. And we've got a bunch of these. So we're a fantastic, beautiful community. Um, and so as we start to you know, work on our recovery and how to have a really strong future beyond that reliance on coal and um, coal-fired power generation, we needed to start changing um, the picture in people's minds of, of what that is. And one of the ways we can do that is by investing in art. Art is um, a really effective way to start to have those conversations, to start to change the picture of people's minds externally, but more than that, to change the picture of in our own minds of what we are um, in, within ourselves, what we think about ourselves. And so our community bank is fortunate enough to be very successful. Um, so we have uh, a fair bit of money that we can inject into things. And one of the first things we did in this journey quite a long time ago now, uh, it's probably about five years ago, is that we invested in the physical space of art. We thought it was really important to have that, um, that hub. Like many, many communities across Australia, um, sport has been very heavily invested in. Uh, there's other programs in education and you know, all sorts of things, but art was really left behind. A lot to do as well. Our community thought we weren't artistic. We thought we were a blokey community, so we must be very sporty and therefore there's not many artists around. The interesting thing was that when, when we built this uh, gallery and the, the Collie Community Bank injected $500,000 into this um, just a bit over $2 million project, this is the, the only A-class gallery purpose-built outside of the WA gallery in 
in Western Australia. So it's very significant for little old Collie and it holds a range of um, traveling exhibitions that come through all the way. We've had artists like Arthur Boyd, uh, his collection in there, all the way through to local artists who wanna hold their own exhibition and, and everywhere in between. So the physical space was really important in, you know, A, giving a, a, a visible presence to the artistic community and also a place for people to gather. This is the inside of the gallery space. We've got um, these, these walls that are movable in here. So this space is very flexible. It can be opened right up or we can create your rooms. Um, this is a, a largely sculptural exhibition that was held pretty early on in the days, but we've had lots of different things through. Um, and what was interesting when we built this place, and we're still getting lots of backlash from the community, it's only for a small number of people, you know, nobody will come, all those sorts of things. The, the art gallery actually has a bigger membership than the football club. So, you know, that was, that was something that surprised us. Um, but, you know, and, and what we also found is that you don't have to choose. You don't have to be sporty or artistic. You get to, you can be both, that's okay. Um, and recognising that within our community was really important as well. Um, this, is, this is actually a couple of local um, people that have joined together to do an exhibition. They do, they do some really great stuff with found objects and um, textiles. Uh, we do lots of participation is really important in the gallery. This is um, what we call the studio gallery, which um, hosts smaller exhibitions that are more cost effective for local artists, but also lots of, um, lots of actual hands-on activities. Um, these guys here, this is the studio club, a group of ladies come every Thursday and they, um, and they teach each other what they know and they talk and they chat, um, mainly ladies, I mean, men, blokes are allowed there too, but I don't think I've ever seen a bloke in this club, in this club but that's okay. Um, and, and really, it doesn't matter about your talent in this club, it's just about getting together and doing those things. So um, it's important to create that hub. Um, lots of events you can kind of, I couldn't find a good photo, but you know, they have little um, events in the background with music playing and a glass of wine and enjoying art and just being in beautiful surroundings and connecting with like-minded people is really important. Um, and also the retail aspect of art. So uh, this is one of the walls in the studio gallery that's often um, taken up by local artists having a little mini exhibition with some works for sale, which is really important. Um, tourists love to buy local pieces of art, but they want to see what's local, they want to see what's around, and it gives a, a nice presence to those emerging artists as well, just as they're starting to put their feet out, you know, and start to bear their soul into the world. This is a really nice, easy way that they can get themselves uh, into that. So that's the physical space, and that was really important. Um, one of the other big programs uh, that Bendigo has supported financially or the Collie Community Bank has supported financially in Collie uh, is the celebration of excellence in art. And so we have, um, we've been the major sponsor for two times now for the Collie Art Prize or the CAP as we call it. Um, and so we've stumped up the $50,000 for what is one of regional Australia's richest art prizes. We set this up as an aspirational prize, very, very deliberately. We wanted it to be a little bit different than all of the other regional art prizes you see around that generally try and give as many prizes out to as many different people as they possibly can. We do have a range of prizes in this one. There's obviously the major art prize, which is acquisitive. Um, there's also uh, the local Rotary Club puts up two prizes um, and there's a Packers prize now. There's a People's Choice Prize, and um, this year there was also introduced uh, Kid Entity, which was a um, prize for children. Now, the theme for this prize was really important as well, in that the theme is always identity. And so Collie is going through a change of identity itself. It's trying to work out what it will be uh, in, the, in the next 20 to 50 years and how it defines itself and what that means. And so we thought it was fitting that we had this um, regional art prize that had identity as its theme and, and it, you know, artists from all over Australia explore this theme in their own ways. So um, it's biennial, we're holding it every two years. Uh, there's a group of people who have gotten together to sort of define that theme and to flesh out, you know, how it will work. Because it is a $50,000 prize, we put a whole lot of work into the terms and conditions to make sure that we had that nailed down. Um, and the, the top prize is acquisitive and, and that's why it's important that that identity theme sort of stays constant as well, because over time, 
the, the pieces that are acquired through this prize will form a collection of their own that ultimately could tour all around Australia. So, um, and, and watching that, the way that the theme of identity has been, you know, uh, dealt with by artists over time will be really interesting as well. Um, you know, in the first year and, and, the sec and the second one as well, around about 500 entries from, from across every state in Australia. Now the Archibald Prize gets about a thousand. So that's pretty significant for a prize in its second iteration. Uh, we made sure that the, that the judges were suitably qualified. We didn't want any sort of, you know, um, any sort of intimation that this wasn't a real art prize, that it wasn't a real thing. We, we very aspirational and tried to stay at that top level from the very get go. And the opening event, um, both times has attracted interstate artists to come across with their families. We managed to get in the opening this year just before COVID hit, which was lovely. Uh, we had to close down the exhibition a little bit um, earlier than we would have liked, but at least we got the opening in uh, for this one. And obviously it gets lots of touring people through as well. This is part of the opening as well. As you can see some of the works, this is the first one. You can see some of the works in the background. They're fantastic and very varied. And um, they allow us to have that conversation about identity amongst ourselves and with some artists who are deep thinkers as well. Um, and so that prize is also a chance to showcase our facility. It's interesting because the, the, the art gallery has been around for, um, for a lot longer than the prize, but it wasn't until this prize was put up and people started to challenge that, no, you're not, a, you're not the only A-class Barry. Well, we are, <laughs> we are um, in, in around the way, but it wasn't until the prize was put up that that sort of gained that national kind of notoriety, which was great. Um, and for the bank itself, it was a chance to, to deepen our relationship with arts in our community and with our customers as well, but also the opportunity to showcase the benefits of the banking model across Australia. Because without the community banking model, there is no way that little old Polly would have, um, would have regional Australia's, one of regional Australia's riches are prize. We're gonna say one of, because there's one other that's the same of our, same um, as ours, but they're in the opposite year to what we do and they're biennial. So there's a couple of communities doing the same thing, but um, there's only a couple of us out there. And without community banking, it just, wouldn't be possible, it just wouldn't happen in a regional area. Oh, and this is, this is the Kid Entity Prize. This is the first year we had um, entries from kids dealing with their own identity. And God, some of them were fantastic. They were really, really clever and well attended by parents and aunties and uncles and, and everybody else. It was just really fantastic to see. Now, the third way that the Collie Community Bank is investing in art in Collie is in that real, the other end of the scale, that absolute everybody get involved um, participation space. So one of the best ways that we do that is through Festivati. It's not the only way, but Festivati is a, an annual festival of arts in Collie. Um, it has a street fair, it has an exhibition, it has lots of workshops, um, and it's basically every kid in Collie's got their art in there somewhere which is great um, we've got lots of people turn out for the festival we had fantastic weather for this one this is our central park area and this is the um we have some performing artists do lots of stuff around the place and it basically you know got people everywhere along the way um the, the little exhibition we had this year was in um in a vacant shop uh and and just pulled together art from every class and every school in the community, which meant that every single person in Collie was basically touched by art over that week, which uh, we think is just fantastic. And the kids get a little buzz out of that. This is um, one of the workshops. So they're not all, you know, traditionally arty. This is the back box building workshop. And then they had a bat finding sort of session the night time, which tends to attract those sorts of things that kind of get the boys involved, which is great. Um, and they're getting their hands in and getting things done. So I think that's good. And, you know, the performing arts is part of that festival and there's lots of little talented um, and gorgeous members of our community that get involved in that. Obviously, there's lots of food and wine and celebration throughout the place. Uh, we've got some of the photography in the background there for that one. This is back in the studio gallery, in the art gallery, which gets involved, but, but the festival does sort of take over the town um, at the same time. And we always make sure with Festival it's important to leave a lasting legacy each year. So every year there's a piece of street art that gets uh, commissioned. Sometimes it's a community collaborative piece. This one was done 
um, by, by a couple of artists that came in and did, did a mural along a um, sort of a dingy laneway, or well, was a dingy laneway, now it's nice and bright and colourful, um, with a sort of a trails theme. So just adding colour, splashing colour all throughout the community is really important in that space. Um, and so what that does with all of those things is, um, you know, when we talked about those really blokey industries before, and trying to change the, the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we've thought of. Um, what that does, we start with art and we start with community, really grassroots stuff. And that helps other more diverse industries so that they could have a place within our community. And that families, when they choose to um, work in one of those industries that we're developing, they feel that they've got a place in our community uh, for the whole family, not just you know, parts of the family. So now we're starting to see um, some real investment and some really exciting industries that are starting in Collie that are sustainable for the long term. So these guys are a couple of um, university students that are setting up a eco concrete thatching plant, taking um, basically four different waste streams and replacing the concrete production, which is incredibly environmentally terrible at the moment. Um, so they're, they're revolution, you know, looking to revolutionise concrete production, um, which is great. Uh, we've got emergency services setting up in Collie, which is sort of the centre of the of the bush in in the state as well. Um, if you put a little dot in the middle between all of the bushfire prone areas, that's Collie. So, um, and that's something that we're really interested in. And uh, we talked before about that really importance to have that that digital connection in a community. We've got um, a, a group that's looking to set up. WA's only large scale data storage in Collie connected to um, the, power, the significant power infrastructure that we have. And what that will mean is necessarily we'll have to have good comps to go to that. So that'll have the side impact of um, hopefully uh, attracting some of those more creative um, in the digital space people that to set up in that area. So that's an interesting one. Um, Canaponics is another really different industry that's looking at setting up in Collie and that's the pharmaceutical and nutraceutical side of hemp. It's a, um, it'll be grown in big greenhouses and it's a completely closed circle right, all in Collie, right from the growing to the manufacturing to the um, waste to the marketing to the chemistry to all of the, the whole area. So suddenly you've got a whole bunch of, a um, whole range of professional uh, occupation starting to attract here. This one here is um, autonomous mining. We've got a, the Southern Hemisphere's only autonomous mining training center. Right now it's just one truck with one training force, but of course that's a brand new, um, well it's, it's, a, it's an industry that's just ready to take off in across mining, uh, but also uh, in other industries such as defence and agriculture. So that's, we're just at the very beginning of what that means in Collie. And again, uh, digital connectivity is really important to, to that industry. Uh, and so what that means is so as we're looking forward into the future and we're thinking about what these kids are gonna see as their town, it's a very, very different space. Uh, it's sustainable, it's connected, it's creative. Uh, it's, it's got a very long future ahead of it so and that all starts with investment in the arts and really nurturing that creative side the softer side uh, the the creatives and the interesting people in our community so that's, Thanks, it. Sarah. that's great uh, very passionate community a very active community and it's great to see what a very small community under 5,000 people can do in terms of a strategic vision and how to how to use creativity to change the uh, the identity of the town itself fantastic thank you um andrew how are you going are you are you happy with your connection and would you happy to andrew is the uh, coordinator of southeast arts in uh, southeast new south wales uh, and, and has got a few stories to tell us about how you're navigating through the uh, the COVID challenges uh thank you yes uh, i do seem to have a good uh, connection now but um uh i did have a few slides but i won't test the system by putting those up so if you forgive me just for uh, being a talking head for for this presentation yeah so i'm the um executive director of southeast arts and in new south wales the way regional arts is supported 
is that there are 14 autonomous organisations, uh, regional arts development orgs, Southeast Arts is one of those. And we have a region, mine goes from Batemans Bay to the Victorian border and up to the Snowy Mountains. So supported by the state government and our uh, local councils, and then we're free to go out and uh, pursue uh, project funding and other support to do the sort of programs that we think are going to support arts and culture in our particular region. Um, an example of our work in this area was uh, a couple of years ago, we presented the, the first ever all Aboriginal arts and cultural festival called Gaiung Festival that we uh, presented in partnership with uh, an Aboriginal organisation in our region. We would have done the second one of those festivals in September this year, but uh, COVID rained on our parade. Uh, but that, that sort of area is still a key uh, project focus for our area. And um, in, in uh, the, this last year, as best we can, and moving into the next few years, working in the cultural tourism area is a key focus for us as well to try and um, generate that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. But for my presentation today, I, I just thought I'd uh, touch on two examples of uh, community uh, generated regional arts that are, that are quite different in their sort of the, the way they've gone about, but are both extremely effective. And I think it's good to consider sort of, you know, both these models and everything in between. So <clears throat> one is uh, Four Winds. Now, Four Winds uh, started as a cult as a classical music uh, festival happening over Easter back in 1991. And for about the next 10 years or so, they, they had a, a very successful festival. They, they'd whack up a quick shelter. There was a, a lovely bush property that a, a, a local person made available. And, um, you know, a good few thousands of people would come and be a part of these classic music festivals. Moving into the 2000s, they became a bit more ambitious and a bit more strategic and wanted to sort of build that and make it a permanent and ongoing event. So they started to um, develop the site and look to, to build the infrastructure at the site um, and also to expand a bit beyond just an annual festival and start mm -hmm. to do touring uh, and run workshops and engage uh, in the community. So that by about 2010, they had built a permanent sound shell for their uh, outside performances. A few years later, they had uh, secured funding and built uh, a uh, the pavilion building, which is a uh, purpose-built 150-seat state-of-the-art acoustic space uh, and they started to get uh, uh, very strong philanthropic support and government support so they're now uh, a, a million dollars a year organization with about three million dollars worth of infrastructure um, and uh, employing a, a team of five people and putting on regular events so it's a fantastic example of how you know what started as just a volunteer run organization with the right um, uh, aspirations and and strategic approach has been able to build and so now it's a a, a key uh, professional arts organization in our region of which there are not very many at all like um, my region is very limited cultural infrastructure we don't ha have any performing arts centers we have one regional gallery uh, and, uh, and and a council one run now in Maruya but you know it's 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 been very lacking in that kind of um, uh, professional end for sustainable sort of programs uh, so four winds is a great example of 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 one that that has really uh, formed a, a good strategic partnerships and developed uh, in that way. As a complete opposite example, but uh, you know, no less effective, um, the Candelow Art Society was started back in 1986. Um, and uh, this shows how old I am. I was one of those founding members. Uh, and Candelow Art Society uh, was started with a, a strong sort of theater focus. This is a little village of about 500 people. Uh, and so for the last 30 odd years, the Canlow Art Society has been run by the community, by volunteers. It stayed very much at that level. But uh, through its long term 
uh, actions and the sort of legacy of it. So it's now being sort of run and managed by, I have to say, some of those young kids that I did theatre shows with back in the 80s have grown up, uh, you know, some have left uh, and come back, some have just um, stayed on. But Candelo is this amazing music hub now. Um, you know, recently we had David Ross McDonald from The Waifs uh, come and live there, Phil Moriarty from The Gadflies. There's a, a professional, uh, there's a collective of professional musicians now. The New Graces, uh, number one on the country music charts with their latest album. So there's this wild, weird concentration of uh, young contemporary musicians that are that are you know within Kui of Candelo and it's really on the map in in that sort of way and the the village festival that happens there every two years is, is a good example again of that um, grassroots community run festival it's tenuous you know you, only, you, you and that's the case with a lot of our volunteer run events and festivals there is an element of, of risk there you only need a few key people to to leave a committee or to say I've had enough I can't do it anymore but um, <clears throat> there's a there's a real um, liveliness and vibrancy to it and it and it does seem to keep sort of powering on so you know on the one hand you've got your four winds fully professional and bringing in a lot of money and on the other hand the the, the community grassroots one they're they're both extremely effective models and they both sort of add to it but just sort of show how that sort of community can grow and I guess coming then to the question uh, that, that's popped up a few times is you know what can local councils do in this way now in my region none of my councils are particularly well off they they haven't got uh, much cash to, to splash around. So often there's this question of, you know, what can they do to support? Um, uh, some of them do develop uh, some infrastructure and we've seen, you know, some galleries and, and uh, performance spaces happen. But even without adding, you know, extra dollars, councils can um, really help by having good arts and cultural policy and plans they can help in their regular communications to promote what's happening in arts. Often councils are involved in tourism, so they can recognise the benefit of supporting cultural tourism to promote the galleries, the festivals, the events, the performances uh, as part of the usual tourism offerings, particularly down here. You know, environment tourism is a key part of it. Come to the beaches, come to the snow, but arts and culture are a key part of it. They can make the whole compliance process a lot easier as well. You know, every festival has to get a DA now you know it can be very confusing you know you've got to get someone from council who's looking after your waste management someone who's doing your food stuff someone who's doing your security and traffic management and they're all in different parts of a council so councils can make that easier by saying here's the one point of contact if you're putting on a festival here's the person in council that you could contact and uh, they can help coordinate all the things that you need to do to comply to put your event on so I just wanted to highlight that fact that you know uh, even a council that, that can't put money into sporting it that's great uh, fantastic if they can there's a lot of ways in which they can still support arts and cultural development uh, just in in the way that they see the importance of it and see the the social uh, economic uh, and cultural benefits that it brings and integrate it uh, across the whole range of what a council would normally be doing anyway so there's my 10 minutes of fame yeah. hope that was helpful <laughs> <laughs> absolutely fantastic Andrew thank you I think many of us could relate to the idea that there are special places within within our communities like the, the, the now location for Four Winds. And certainly I think a lot of us could, could think of uh, groups of people, uh, uh, highly capable groups, of people, pockets of people within our places that are doing pretty amazing things in that creative sector. And thank you also, Andrew, for jumping in on that question about what local government can do. Uh, it has been a steady uh, point of, of, of questioning amongst the audience members. We've got about uh, eight minutes now for a bit of discussion. Uh, that question, uh, there's a number of themes that are coming through. One, one theme has been around, you know, horrible word, but sort of opera, operationalising things like, I think people were quite taken, Sarah, with the story about the 
the gallery and where that came from. And I think there's been a fair bit of commentary in the chat already on that. So, so thank you. And the other key theme is around that relationship between arts and culture and local government and what can local government do. So I'd like to just pick up and follow on on, on your um, theme, Andrew. Um, Helen, uh, Helen uh, from Performing Arts Connections, you had, you had a, a question on, on a similar theme about how to engage and how to, how to what, 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 what could we do to bring local governments in at a time when we know that their budgets are being stretched because of all the other act activities and responsibilities they've, they've picked up during COVID. Would you like to ask your question to the panel? Yeah, I'm Chair of Performing Arts Connections and 135 of our 240 members are venues, nearly all of them owned by local government in regional and outer metropolitan Australia. So they're busy reopening, they're planning for an Australia where local talent development is the immediate priority rather than national tours. They often the region the professional skills that the speakers have so brilliantly talked about. Um, but how do we make local government a real partner in the creative economy? You know, mostly we hear about things like the Australia Council at federal level or state agencies. Does there need to be a sort of three level plan for the arts? What, how do we help local government become an, an equal partner? They hold the infrastructure, they, but not so much the operational funds, given all the pressures are under now. Great question, thank you. I might ask each of our panellists in turn. Rose, do you have a, some comments on that? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Helen, for that. Um, I think there's a few things there. Um, I think that the sense of, um, like, uh, I know that local government, particularly the performing arts venues, as you mentioned, but also galleries, like a huge percentage of them are either local council owned or local council managed um, across the country. And I think the important part here is that they are a fundamental fabric of the, the community. They're not just the Performing Arts Centre or just the gallery. There's so much more than that embedded into the community in a very, very broad way. Um, and I think that's something that we need to start being working across all levels of government to communicate that broad interface. Um, and so, and I know, you know, as you talk about some of the galleries are, are opening or have opened, some of the smaller uh, theatres have also opened or opening to limited capacities. But I think it's about looking at that stage process around supporting education programs, supporting um, professional development opportunities, supporting pathways for practice and for practitioners, both on the stage and behind the stage. So about connecting with, with technology and with education and training. Um, and then it's around the production and the presentation of work. And I think um, the other thing that will be fundamental in the coming years, um, certainly as of now going forward, is that um, supporting the development of local work by local artists with local communities and then having that intra um, intra-governmental touring model where we're actually seeing work not necessarily coming from a city location to a regional location but going from region to region to region and then how that forms a sort of more broad narrative and I think if we then work um, with those local councils to see what support they need um, and to have that across portfolio so it's not just sitting on the shoulders of an arts and cultural officer it's not just sitting on the shoulders of one department it's across departments and embedded in the whole of the council plan that's that's fundamental. Thanks, Ros. Sarah, you've obviously done a lot of work with and outside of council. How does that, how's that played out in Collie? What, what would your advice be for making council get involved, helping council get involved? Yeah, look, local governments are so varied across different areas um, and some of them are flush with cash um, and some of them aren't. And so there's obviously different capacity and ability to help in different ways. So uh, in Collie, we, we, can't, we don't have a lot of money to, to throw around. People think that we're very rich because we've got all this industry, but um, of, of the main industries, there's only one that actually contributes to our rate base in any meaningful way. So we don't have um, lots of offices that can run around and do things. We don't have lots of cash to splash. But even in those areas, I think there's things that um, local government can do to help. And um, one of the big things is, is try and get out of the way at times <laughs> so that we help people through the regulatory environment um, rather than just throwing obstacles in their way. And this is particularly rele relevant for things like, you know, activities in thoroughfares, so markets or, you know, mm. events, um, all those sorts of things. Um, it's also relevant for, you know, any of the health sorts of um, regulatory issues. So mm. just really trying to be that enabler rather than the, the big stick regulator is really important. Any local government can do that. And that's a real focus on customer service rather than you know that focus on the regulatory environment. Yep, you've got to do these things, but let's help you through, let's help you find the easiest and the, and the cheapest and you know the, the path of least resistance for you rather than just handing you a whole bunch of eggs and say, you go work it out. Um, that's something that any local government can do. And I don't know that we generally, you know, Local government offices um, are there because 
that's the sort of work that they're good at and so they're good at making sure that people tick those boxes and you know that that's something that we can probably do a little bit better across you know I don't think there's any local government across the the, the land that wouldn't say you know they could probably do better in that space um, and also just really you know providing the tools to community members um, in small local areas so where you don't have you know a grants officer or a um, or a community developments officer or a community arts officer, all those, you know, nice to have kind of positions, um, really helping empower the local community to do that. I see lots and lots of grant applications um, come across, you know, th particularly through the community bank, but, um, you know, really trying to build capacity in grant writing in the community will make a huge difference to, um, to the sorts of funding that they're able to attract and therefore, you know, the sorts of resources they're able to attract as well. And I think the other thing that needs to happen um, across Australia and, and the states as well is to really change the way that grant funding is able to be allocated to people. So yeah. if it's wages and salaries, it's almost or operational, it's really it's almost impossible to get. And and that's really difficult for things like, you know, so the gallery is a good example for that. That's um, a, a, it's a local government asset, but it's run by a not-for-profit organisation. If they were able to incorporate wages and salaries into their grants, into their project grants, then that helps them gather more funds, that helps them do some more work, and it's actually more cost effective than it is, you know, hiring in a consultant, which you can put in your grants, but you can't put wages and salaries. Yeah. You're still literally paying a person to do a job. So it's much more cost effective to have that spread out on somebody on, on wages and salaries than those short-term project roles that you end up okay. having in there. Right. So for yeah, for, for little communities, that makes a huge difference. Yeah, you know, you're quite right. There's a real aversion to paying people rather than sort of buying things. I think, which is a, a challenge for a lot of programs. Andrew, you talked very well earlier on about that. Uh, trying to for councils trying to think about the arts in 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 their usual and normal operations as well, either in sort of promoting outside or in sort of making those operations simpler, as, as Sarah Sarah was talking about. Has has that worked well in in some of the places that that you know in the southeast? Yeah, look, it, it can make a big difference and and just reduce the sort of barriers to uh, people putting things on. But I, I guess just making a, a comment, um, the creative industries is a very different industry to a lot of, you know, the other industries that we think about. Um, and it's and it's good if councils can recognise that as well. You know, they're, they're more likely to be uh, sole traders. Uh, they may or may not employ people. You know, and often we we sort of uh, a lot of uh, industry development schemes are measured by well, how many people did you employ? Well, you can actually be a very successful creative practitioner and never employ anyone. Yeah. You could be generating you know good income, good sales, uh, and uh, delivering a whole range of products. So part of it too is recognizing that the creative industries are a bit different to how we see other industries. And if if councils want to support uh, a, a recent uh, local example is they supported uh, an innovation hub mm -hmm. that was established here. So people, and this isn't just in the creative side, but you know, people with startup ideas and, and uh, th those, those kind of initiatives where you're giving people, um, you know, business skills support, uh, how to to market and communicate well, you know, financial management, that whole range of, of skills where you, you give them those business skill basics while they're taking their creative ideas for, for uh, programs forward uh, is, is again another way to sort of see that they could be playing a role in that area. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, and look, we're, we're, we're out of time. We've sort of pushed our time limit a bit, I think. So thanks again to our panellists. Uh, thank you for all, all the audience for joining us online. We will make this a recording of this webinar available on our website, regionsrising.regionalaustralia.org.au. If you'd like to watch it again or share it with your friends, uh, please keep the conversations going on social media. And we hope to see you at our next uh, webinar, which will be a slightly longer form. Uh, we're going to try a virtual summit in November. We'll be releasing some new research, so keep your eyes peeled for uh, notifications about that. Uh, thanks again to our panellists and thanks to the audience, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in November. Thank you.